Oh, that's a chakra? That's a chakra. Also. But that's not the chakra you had. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, where'd that come from? Um, sure, I went to India a long time ago. I think it was the ones who made the juggernaut outside of that. Shishu, shu. That's what it is. Yeah. Subashish. Subashish. Subashish and Ipsita. Yeah, they're really nice. Okay, are we on? Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Vihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Vihari I'm <laughs> 
Srila Prabhupada ki jai, Shri Shri Goni Thai ki jai, Lord Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Devi ki jai, Lord Nushanadev ki jai, Shri Mahat Bhagavad Gita ki jai, Go Premanandi, all glories to the assembled devotees, all glories to the assembled devotees, all glories to the assembled devotees. All glories, all glories to Sri Sri Guru and Goranga. Glories to Srila Prabhupada. Okay, we're up to 20, 26. Okay, ninth chapter, the most confidential knowledge, text 26, which is a very famous verse that many devotees quote because Srila Prabhupada quoted it often. So, you can repeat after me. Patram Pushpam Toyam. Asnami Prayatatmanaha Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam Bhaktiya Prayachati Varaham Bhaktiya Uparitam Varaham Bhaktiya Uparitam Asnami Prayatatmanaha Asnami Prayatatmanaha Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam Yomi Bhaktiya Prayachati Adaham Bhakti Uparitam Ashnami Prayatatmanaha Ashnami Prayatatmanaha Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam Yome Bhaktiya Prayachati Adaham Bhakti Uparitam Asnami Prayatatmanaha Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam Yome Bhaktiya Prayachati Tadaham Bhakti Uparitam Asnami Prayatatmanaha Anybody there? Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam Yome Bhakti Aprayachati Yome Bhakti Aprayachati Tad Aham Bhakti Uparitam Tad Aham Bhakti Uparitam Ashnami Prayatmanaha Ashnami Prayatmanaha Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam Patram Pushpam Palam Toyam Yome Bhaktya Prayachati Yome Bhaktya Prayachati Tad Aham Bhaktya Paharatam Tad Aham Bhaktya Paharatam Ashnami Prayatatmanaha Ashnami Prayatatmanaha Let's forget it. Anyone else? Patram a leaf, a leaf, a leaf, pushpam, pushpam, a flower, a flower, a lam, a lam, a fruit, a fruit, toyam, toyam, water, water, yaha, yaha, whoever, whoever, may, may, unto me, unto me, bhaktiya, bhaktiya, with devotion, with devotion, prayachati, prayachati, offers, offers, that, that. Aham, I, Bhakti Uparitam, offered in devotion, offered in devotion, Asnami, Asnami, accept, accept, Prayata Atmanaha, Prayata Atmanaha, from one in pure consciousness, from one in pure consciousness, translation, 
If one offers me with love and devotion a leaf, a flower, fruit, or water, I will accept it. Purport. For the intelligent person, it is essential to be in Krishna consciousness, engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord, in order to achieve a permanent blissful abode for eternal happiness. Okay, well, because this is a rather long purport, I'm going to comment as I read along in the purport, rather than read the purport and then kind of going over it again. <clears throat> So for the intelligent person, the intelligent person doesn't want birth, disease, old age, and death. They want an eternity, bliss, and knowledge. So if, in order to achieve eternity, bliss, and knowledge, it is essential to be in Krishna consciousness. So the intelligent person wants to be Krishna conscious, even if it's only in the beginning, just for, for my own well-being, because I want to be happy. I mean, in the material world, everyone wants to be happy. Uh, I mean, in the spiritual world, they, they're they above that, and they just want to make Krishna happy, because they're, that's what even makes them happy. In the material world, we want to be happy, but we don't really know, with material consciousness, what makes us happy. We think uh, money, a woman, followers, which is things Lord Chaitanya didn't want. He just he, he just wanted to serve Krishna birth after birth. He didn't even want to go back to the spiritual world. He was completely satisfied just serving Krishna. Pleasing Krishna is the greatest happiness anyone can have. And But he wasn't looking at all for happiness because he was above that. Uh, so the intelligent person... It's, in, it is in, it's essential to be in Krishna consciousness. In Krishna consciousness, engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. So it's not like I'm just sitting here thinking of Krishna, even though that's good, but we should be engaged in, in service. Because you can't just, especially in Kali Yuga, you really got to do something. So, and we're following a, a, a preaching, this is a, we're part of a preaching movement, so we have to, I mean, people don't like the word preaching anymore because that sounds like you're, you're, you're better than they are. You can't even use different words, but it means the same things. You're trying to help these people. You're talking to them. It's not that we're better than anybody. But it's just that we are for, more fortunate. We met someone who told us the truth and we accepted it, and now we want to tell it to others. So that, I mean, it's sharing, you could say. So we want to give this to others because it's the best thing for, for them, and they may not know it, so we try to give it. So, uh, so we engage in this service of trying to spread Krishna consciousness in order to achieve a permanent blissful abode for eternal happiness. The process of achieving such a marvelous result is very easy and can be attempted even by the poorest of the poor without any kind of qualification. So now, whatever any kind of qualification is talking about material qualification. You can be illiterate. You can be poor. You can be diseased. You can have. You don't need any material qualification. And also, in devotional service, there's no material impediment. It doesn't matter what your situation is. You can still serve Krishna. Even if you're in jail, even if you're beaten, you can still remember Krishna. Pallad Maharaj remembered Krishna. He perfected his life. He just remembered Krishna going to all kinds of torture, trying to be killed, and Krishna kept protecting him. And he thought, if, if you, you know, if you, if I'm a soul surrendered unto you, if you want me to live, no one can kill me. If you want me to die, no one can save me. It's whatever you want. <clears throat> so you can be the poorest of the poor without any kind of qualification as I mentioned, material qualification. The only qualification required is this connection, in this connection, is to be a pure devotee of the Lord. So a pure devotee, we're not pure devotees, so therefore we're not qualified. But we can act on that platform of pure devotion, even if we're not on that platform always, at least we want to offer something to Krishna, 
we try to offer it with love and devotion. We try to do something for Krishna. We try to distribute some books because it's pleasing to Prabhupada. So, and that puts us on the spiritual platform. And Prabhupada has said at different times that the devotee, all my devotees, are pure devotees. That's as long as we're we're staying on, on this boat of pure. We're following certain principles. We're chanting certain rounds, and we're we're doing some service. Then we stay on the boat. As long as we're on the boat, the boat's going to bring us there. So we have to just keep ourselves, and the way to stay on the boat is by doing those, following these rules and regulations. It does not matter what one is or where one is situated. The process is so easy that even a leaf or a little water or fruit can be offered to the Supreme Lord in genuine love, and the Lord will be pleased to accept it. So there's the secret again is love. If one offers me with love and devotion, a leaf, a flower, fruit, or water, I will accept it. He doesn't need a leaf, flower, fruit, or water. He owns everything. He doesn't need anything. He's totally self-satisfied. But if you offer it with love, he accepts it. And by him accepting it, you get purified. So it's not a hard thing. This, this purport explains also what you can't offer. So this is like when we, we have prashadam. We serve out prashadam every Sunday, and hopefully starting next month or soon, every Wednesday, we want to start a program too. But right now, because the pandemic is, is, is going, still out of control, we're just going to wait a little while longer. So, uh, and then we, we have this prashadam. So we make nice food stuffs, no one tastes it. Uh, and, and then it's offered with love and devotion to Krishna, and Krishna accepts it if it's offered with love and devotion. So no one, therefore, can be barred from Krishna consciousness because it is so easy and universal. So it's not like this Krishna consciousness is only for the Indians or only for the men. It's, this Krishna consciousness is for any, anyone and everyone, or it's only for the adults. It's anyone. Children are Krishna conscious, naturally. So no one is barred. All you have to do is, is, as, or, or is, is do your service and your offerings with love and devotion. So no one, therefore, can be barred from Krishna consciousness because it's so easy and universal. Who is such a fool that he does not want to be Krishna conscious by this simple method and thus attain the highest perfection of life, eternity, bliss, and knowledge? So what is so hard? It's not hard. Krishna consciousness is not hard. It's not like you have, you know, you, you, the Olympics and you want to compete in something. You got to kill yourself for, for months or years working so hard at, to achieve this. You don't kill yourself and this is such a natural thing. You know, you just, you, you eat, some, you have to cook or someone cooks. So before it's, you eat it, you offer it first to Krishna. Everything belongs to Krishna. So everything should be offered to him first. It's not hard, and except for some fool, everyone should take the Krishna consciousness. I guess people don't take because they, well, first of all, the restrictions may be, you know, I don't want to stop that, I don't want to stop that because, you know, these are the things that give me happiness and I don't get any other happiness, so... I won't have any happiness. But actually, you get a higher taste. Patram pushpam palam toyom. No, that's this verse here. Yeah. No, you do. What's the verse? I'm getting this verse mixed up with my other verse. Uh, but yes, I'm destroying the word to take. You, by 
by experiencing a higher taste, you can give up the lower taste. So why wouldn't anyone do it? Be lots of times they don't listen, they can't hear, their minds are just non-stop going and they, it's hard for them to pay attention, it's hard for them to sit still. You know, I remember in school they would say, I want your undivided attention. And I, I never gave it to them. <laughs> <laughs> My attention was always divided to so many different things. But, uh, but that's the way we should be when we're hearing about Krishna. Who is such a fool that he does not want to be in Krishna consciousness by this simple method and thus attain the highest perfection of life, of eternity, bliss? This is what you're going to get. Prabhupada came here. He knew what this was eternity, bliss, and knowledge, and he wants to give it to everyone. And very few people were taking advantage of it. Krishna wants only loving service and nothing more. Krishna accepts even a little flower from his pure devotee. He does not want any kind of offering from a non-devotee. So we're not non-devotees, we're devotees and sometimes we might be acting on a pure platform, sometimes it's mixed, but we're certainly devotees. Because we're, we wouldn't be hearing about Krishna, we wouldn't be chanting Hare Krishna, we wouldn't follow any of these principles if we weren't devotees. So we're some, somewhat of devotees. So we have to do this, and then Krishna accepts these offerings. And now, a little about Krishna. He is not in need of anything from anyone because he is self-sufficient. And yet he accepts the offering of his devotee in an exchange of love and affection. He doesn't need it. It's not like, uh, well, if you do this for me, you know, I, I'd want it. I need it. But it's not for him. It's for us. But if we offer with love, he accepts because he's a person. It's like a little child has some, I don't know, just some candy that you bought them, and then they offer you some. You know, you accept, the parent accepts it. You know, even the parent doesn't like it, he, he or she accepts it, because the child is offering it with love, caring about you. Of course, the child might ask for it back. <laughs> We don't ask for it back. We'd actually be really happy if it was completely gone. But Krishna is so kind that he eats it and it's still there. You know, we say he eats with his eyes uh, because he can look at it and eat because all his senses are interchangeable, which this purple will explain that. And here Prabhupada says he eats with, with his ears. When he hears the mantras, he eats. When he hears that love from the devotees, he eats just by hearing or just by seeing. To develop Krishna consciousness is the highest perfection of life. <laughs> you know, people have so many different goals in life. I want to be rich. I want to be, uh, uh, have a lot of followers or have a lot of employees. Once I, want, I want, you know, thousands of people working for my big, huge company. I want to be, it's like, that's not going to make you happy. I mean, it, it, you can use it in Krishna's service, which is nice. But otherwise, what's the purpose? But here it says, he accepts the, the offering of his... No. Uh, to develop Krishna consciousness is the highest perfection of life. That's what we should be striving for. We can work and we can make, we make money, especially make enough money so that you can maintain your family nicely. You're not struggling, so you don't have to struggle and you have time for Krishna consciousness. But then, but if we don't have this balance of side by side, you know, nations and Krishna consciousness, uh, it's, it's just a complete waste of time maintaining yourself. What the heck for? I mean, I realized that when I was 23. Like, what's the per point of this whole life? If, 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 if it's just all the externals, what is the point? It's just a waste of time. 
Well, there has to be more, and there is more. And if you use it properly, then you go back home, back to Godhead. And even if we don't go back home, back to Godhead in this lifetime, even if we have to take another birth or 10 births or whatever, we're still getting closer and closer every single birth that we take. I mean, hopefully we can actually, like Prabhupada says, do our business and get out of here. But, you know, we, we, we may not be that that platform, but at least we're, we're putting our money in the right bank account. It's an eternal bank account. You put it in the other bank account, and you can have billions, and it's all gone at the time of death. I mean, okay, I'm going to write a will so it goes here and there. Terrific. <laughs> you know, of course, if you give it to, to Krishna, then there's some benefit. But... Uh, but you have to, you, at least if you're making billions or millions or anything, that's not so important. It's, but it's important to, to practice your Krishna consciousness at the same time. You know, to try and chant so many rounds a day. I, I think I said this very recently, because I read it pretty recently, uh, about the rounds, 16 rounds. You know, where it says it in the scriptures, devotee was asking Prabhupada, and Prabhupada says it doesn't say 16 rounds. It said you should chant a fixed number of rounds, and I, and I fixed 16. So even if we're not chanting 16, even if we have a fixed number of four rounds a day, eight rounds a day, whatever it might be, six rounds a day, even one round a day, but at least start with a fixed number and gradually increase it till eventually you're doing 16 a day. And then, and then, you know, following the principles, then getting initiated, so many things. But that's the important. To develop Krishna consciousness is the highest perfection of life, the highest. There are so many different perfections of life. You can perfect this, you can perfect that. Prabhupada says if you can pract you practice something, you can perfect it. So you can perfect so many things, but the highest perfection of life is Krishna consciousness. So bhakti is mentioned how many times in this verse? Shiva looks like she's thinking. Oh. Yes. Anyway, twice. It's mentioned twice in this verse in order to declare more emphatically that bhakti or devotional service is the only means to approach Krishna. So he's stressing it. Prabhupada says when, like even you're not that body, Prabhupada stresses it so much because it's an important point. You gotta kind of gotta, gotta get above that. When lots of times Prabhupada's talking to the Christians, Christians he talks about not eating meat. See if you say something. It says, uh, bhaktya prayachati and bhakti upara uparitam. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a Sanskrit guy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't pay so much attention to the English. <laughs> or devotional service is the only means to approach Krishna. No other condition, such as, these are some conditions you might say in order to approach Krishna. Becoming a Brahmin. You have to be Brahmin. You've got to be born in a Brahmin. And you can't be a Brahmin unless you're born in an Indian Brahmin family. Then you can be Brahmin. So you have to take at least one birth. Then you can go back home, back to Godhead. But Prabhupada says, no other condition, such as becoming a Brahmin, a learned scholar. You don't have to be a learned scholar. You don't have to be, to know, you don't have to know all these books so perfectly, all the Vedas and everything. You just study, you just try to remember what you can. 
And, and, and it's more important to know practically how to apply it and what it means. Like, like the South Indian Brahmin who couldn't read and was crying when he's reading the Gita and people wondering, why are you crying? You can't read. They're making fun of him. Lord Chaitanya asked, you know, why was he uh, crying? Because I, I'm supposed to read Bhagavad Gita every day and I don't know how to read. Because my guru told me to read it every day. So he said, but why, so why are you crying? He said, because when I think of Krishna, Supreme Personality of Godhead, taking the part of a chariot driver of his devotee, that brings tears to my eyes. And then Lord Chaitanya said, you have, you know, realized Bhagavad Gita. So it's practically realizing it. It's very simple. He's an illiterate, but he can understand that. And that, and that in itself is enough. You don't have to be such a learned scholar. You can be very simple. It's, it's, it's not difficult. Prabhupada said, what is the difficulty? So many times. What's his name? Shruti Kirti. He wrote that book, What is the Difficulty? He was Prabhupada's servant. What is the difficulty? Because it's not difficult. What are we doing that's so difficult? What? Nothing. Every, it's not, you gotta lift so much weight, you gotta, it, it's like chant, you gotta chant. So no other condition such as becoming a brahmana, a learned scholar, a very rich man, or a great philosopher can induce Krishna to accept some offering. So you may be a, a, learn, a learned brahmana, a learned scholar, a rich man, great philosopher, but that doesn't induce Krishna to accept your offering. But if you have a little love and devotion, then he accepts. Without the basic principle of bhakti, nothing can induce the Lord to agree to accept anything from anyone. Pretty nice. And anyone can have bhakti. If you're a great philosopher, you can't have bhakti. You know, lots of times if you're, you're, you're great, you have great abilities, you know, you get puffed up. I'm better than these other people. And that's, and that's something Krishna doesn't like. That's not bhakti. So bhakti is never causal. What does that mean, bhakti is never causal? The process is eternal. It is direct action in service to the absolute whole. I'll read that again. So without the basic principle of bhakti, nothing can induce the Lord to agree to accept anything from anyone. Bhakti is never causal. Causal means what? If you're talking bhakti, it doesn't cause Krishna to do something. Is that what you're it, it actually does. Huh? It does cause Krishna. What was the sentence before it? <laughs> It says, without ba the basic principle of bhakti, nothing can induce the Lord to agree to accept anything from anyone. Bhakti is never causal. Was it a dentist office? <laughs> so does that mean it's an effect? It's the, it's the cause. I don't know. I'm not sure what it, well, what it means. Ganapati, what do you think it means? Bhakti is never causal. That's a sentence itself. Bhakti is never causal. Uh, nothing, I mean, you should not think that if this happens, then I will do bhakti, I think. If what happens? Sorry? If what happens, what? Basically, if there are certain conditions are met, then I will do bhakti. I think that's right. But it does. Cause effect, cause and effect. But bhakti is never causal. In other words, maybe there's nothing that you know that you do that causes bhakti. I don't know what you said, but it didn't, it's no. You said nothing causes bhakti. I don't know. Anyway, there's no material cause for bhakti. We can say that. Yeah, they say bhakti comes from bhakti. Well, that's where it comes from. Bhakti comes from bhakti, for those who didn't hear. Okay, the process is eternal. So we've got plenty of time to keep going at it if we have to. It is direct action 
in service to the absolute whole. So that's nice. It's actually direct action in service. It's, you, you do something for Krishna. So you prepare some food and you offer it. That's direct action in service to the absolute whole. Here, Lord Krishna, having established that he is the only enjoyer. Oh, wow, there's a lot more to the purport. The only enjoyer, the primeval Lord, and the real object of all sacrificial offerings reveals what type of sacrifices he desires to be offered. If one wishes to engage in devotional service to the Supreme in order to be purified and to reach the goal of life, that thing's making so much noise, the transcendental loving service of God, that's the goal of life, then one should find out what the Lord desires of him. So we're going to get into, he wants a leaf, a flower, fruit, or water. Now, when you're making offerings to the demigods, you have to offer, you have to have, you have to have money. You know, in one sense, you can't just, uh, of course, Lord Shiva, you can offer bilva leaves, uh, wherever you can get them. <laughs> uh, but for most uh, demigods, you have to perform elaborate sacrifices and offering so much ghee and you know, different, different things into the fire. But Krishna makes it easy. It doesn't cost much at all. Even water. Anyone can get some water. So one who loves Krishna will give him whatever he wants. And he avoids offering anything which is undesirable or unasked. Not one who loves Krishna. I mean, one who loves Krishna, yes. But one who loves anyone. You love a girl, you get her what she wants. You love a guy, you love your, your parents. You get them what they want. You don't get them what you want. You know, you get them, you know, you want some, uh, well, I don't want, I can't think of any good examples as devotees. Well, you can get them a set of Bhagavatams, you know. <laughs> to, to, I mean, to, to Indian parents, that'll be fine, but to Western parents, it's like, Whoa. well, I'll take them. <laughs> but at least I tried. Well, I'll do it on that one day, and then I'll take them back again after that. Bhajrapurnima. <laughs> then I can, uh, at least I did it. Uh, but if somebody likes, okay, it's someone you're cooking for someone, and they and they let you know, I don't like spinach, I just don't like it, and you make them spinach, what are they gonna think? This person doesn't like me or is an idiot, one or the other. <laughs> so Krishna lets us know what he wants. Thus, meat, Fish and eggs should not be offered to Krishna. If he desired such things as offering, he would have said so. Instead, he clearly requests that a leaf, fruit, flowers, and water be given to him. And he says, of this offering, I will accept it. He even says, it, 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 he says, it's also in, I don't know, here it says flowers, but he says, I think when he says it, it's all singular. You offer me a leaf, a flower. You know, not even, don't even have to offer me more than one flower or more than one leaf or fruit. Offer me a fruit. Therefore, we should understand that he will not accept meat, fish, and eggs, vegetables, grains, fruits, milk, and water are the proper foods for human beings and are prescribed by Lord Krishna himself. So I'm thinking someone may say, why milk? He didn't say, he didn't ask for milk. You know, but if you know anything about Krishna, he was a cowherd boy and he likes milk and his mother would give him the best milk from the best cows that produce. So different cows produce different kinds of milk. Some you know, like brown cows produce chocolate milk. 
Now, that's a joke for anybody who, <laughs> who might be listening and think that's really true. <laughs> no, but different cows produce different milk. There are, I think, like Jerseys produce very, very uh, creamy milk, a lot of cream. Uh, anyway, different cows, and then there's uh, Holsteins, and they just produce a lot of milk, a lot more. Jerseys don't produce as much. So, but in Krishna's time, they didn't have any of those kind of cows. They didn't have jerseys. They had Vrindavans and <laughs> Dwarkas. <laughs> because Jersey is a place, you know. Yeah. Anyway, but they did, they had different cows. And amongst their cows, they were, they were all Sarabi cows. They give unlimited milk. But at the same time, certain ones gave the really best milk. I think she had 10 of them. And she took those to make different preparations for Krishna. Krishna really likes milk. So we can we may not know that from, from this particular, th what he's saying, because even here he's making it even easier. You might not be able to get milk. But you, in India, you can, you can even get fruit. There's so many trees. And you definitely can get leaves and you can get water. And flowers, there's flowers. A story about flowers. Uh, I just heard or read, I don't remember, but from Kuladri. When Prabhupada was, I don't remember where it was, may have been Atlanta, Georgia, and Nuvrindavan was driving down and they didn't, they didn't have any money for spending for flowers. So they just picked flowers from the, on the side of the road and stuff and then on on the way, then they made garland. For, they made a garland for Prabhupada, and they they were thinking of not offering it to him because he had garlands of gardenias, roses. He had so many garlands, so they offered him the the garland. And and Prabhupada was so pleased. He says, "This is the garland like Krishna, the the gopis would make for Krishna from the forest. Just pick the flowers from the forest and make the garlands." So even that, you know, just getting all her flowers for free and uh, and Prabhupada was very very pleased with it so vegetable grains fruit milk and water are the proper foods for human beings and are prescribed by Lord Krishna himself whatever else we eat cannot be offered to him since he will not accept it thus we cannot be acting on the level of loving devotion if we offer such foods. So it's not love and devotion. If somebody doesn't like something, then that's what you offer them. And you know they don't like it. Why are you doing this? In the third chapter, verse 13, Sri Krishna explains that only the remnants of sacrifice are purified and fit for consumption by those who are seeking advancement in life and release from the clutches of the material entanglement. That verse is something to do with it. If uh, foods that are offered to me get freed from sin, and those who eat foods that are that are not offered are rarely eating only sin. So you get freed from sins by eating prashada. Not only you're not creating any sin, but you get free from the sins you have already created. And even Prabhupada says, you know, we're eating our ways back to Godhead because we just eat prasadam and you get freed from sins and you're going back to God. So those who do not make an offering of their food, he says in the same verse, are eating only sin. In other words, their every mouthful is simply deepening their involvement in the complexities of material nature. But preparing nice, simple vegetable dishes, offering them before the picture or deity of, the, of Lord Krishna, and bowing down and praying for him to accept such an humble offering enables one to advance steadily in life, to purify the body, and to create fine brain tissues, which will lead to clear thinking. Uh, here it says bowing down. When they make offerings now, they don't bow down, do they? I don't know, but we used to. 
He used to pay dun, do full dandavat, even. But they don't do it anymore. Why? I'm sure there's a reason. I want to know if you know what it is. But here he says, bowing down. Okay. Before the deity or, or of Lord Krishna and bowing down and praying for him to accept such a humble offering enables one to advance steadily in life, to purify the body, and to create fine brain tissues, which will lead to clear thinking. Above all, the offering should be made with an attitude of love. Krishna has no need of food, since he already possesses everything that be, yet he will accept the offering of one who desires to please him in that, in that way. The important element in preparation, in serving, and in offering is to act with love for Krishna. So it's not just the offering itself, but in preparing the food. You're doing it for, for, out of love for Krishna. So now we talk about the impersonalists. The impersonalist philosophers who wish to maintain that the absolute truth is without senses cannot comprehend this verse of Bhagavad Gita to them. It is either a metaphor or proof of the mundane character of Krishna, the speaker of the Bhagavad Gita. But in actuality, Krishna, the Supreme God, it has senses. And it is stated that his senses are interchangeable. In other words, one sense can perform the function of any other. So the impersonalist, why, why would, if he's God, why would he ask for food to offer to him and then accept it? You know, when God is Brahman, he doesn't, Brahman is this energy, this force, this light. That's what they're thinking. So how can he accept it that proves that he's not God? And so that's what they say. This is what it means to say that Krishna is absolute. What it means is he's absolute. Any sense can be used in, uh, as any other sense. So he can, he can smell with his ears. So lacking senses, he could hardly be considered full in all opulences. In the seventh chapter, Krishna has explained that he impregnates the living entities into material nature. This is done by his looking upon material nature. And so, in this instance, Krishna's hearing the devotee's words of love in offering foodstuffs is wholly identical with his eating and actually tasting. So there's no difference. He's just hearing the love, the prayers offered in love, and he tastes the food by just hearing it. This point should be emphasized because of his absolute position. His hearing is wholly identical with his eating and tasting. Only the devotee who, accept, who accepts Krishna as he describes describes himself without interpretation can understand that the supreme absolute truth can eat food and enjoy it so he actually enjoys the food but it's it's because of the love even the devotee once out of love peeled a banana to offer to krishna and out of ecstasy he threw away the banana and gave Krishna the peel. And Krishna ate the peel and enjoyed eating the peel because it was offered with love. I don't think you should see how advanced you are by trying something like that and seeing if Krishna eats it. Speaking of bananas and peels, I remember one of the Maybe not the first time, but the first time I went to India where I actually had any any money whatsoever. First two times I had nothing. Well, at least the first time. First time I had 10 rupees, yeah. Anyway, we bought bananas to feed the cows. Actually, me and Gil, those who, well, if anybody's online and knows Gil, and this was in Jagannath Puri. 
and we're uh, after buying them, then we're feeding the cows, but we're peeling the bananas. They said, no, pe the Indian, don't peel them, you just give them the, we didn't know, you just eat the skin too. So, I just thought about that after Krishna ate the skin, the cows, they eat it, and the elephants. What? Was it any good? Somebody made a subji with the peelings of a banana. You can you can certainly offer the banana flour. I was in Mumbai, the farm, that that farm that they that have now. It's the Echo Echo Farm. It wasn't at that time. Yeah, Echo Village. Yeah, and the devotee, one devotee who was. I don't think he lived there. He was traveling, I think, with us at the time. But he, they got the banana plant and he cooked it and made it. And I don't remember if I tasted it or not. But I know if I did, it wasn't bad because I would have remembered that. But anyway, so you can offer banana flowers. Okay, any questions or comments? I have one question. Maybe one aspect, and I don't know how good it is that when we sleep, we close the eyes. When we what? When we sleep or rest, we yeah. close the eyes. Yeah. But on altar, deities never close their eyes. So it's like my question is, does the altar no one sleeps in the spiritual world, or they sleep with open eyes? Why do you say the deities don't close their eyes? Okay, why do you think that? Okay, do you see the deities moving? Do the deities move? Yes. So why can they move and not close their eyes? I don't know. That's why I'm asking the question to an advanced devotee. I'm not a devotee. I wouldn't say they don't close their eyes. I think they close their eyes. Why not? Yeah. You can talk, you can walk. Right, right. So if he can move, he can close his eyes. Any other questions? <laughs> Pierre Prabhu, you said something about if you love, a, if a man loves a woman or a woman loves a man, they'll buy, get them what they want. But right. just for just for fun, I somebody had told me about this Indian gentleman would always buy his wife for her birthday, whatever he wanted. If he wanted a new phone, he'd buy her a phone. If he wanted a new lawnmower, he would buy her a lawnmower. <laughs> he'd buy her whatever he wanted for her birthday. So, there are people who do that. Yeah, well, it shows his love. <laughs> for himself. Right, right. <laughs> You might do something like that as a joke, but have something else also. Yeah, yeah. What did she give him at his birthday? Flowers. <laughs> I have no idea. A nice sorry. <laughs> Jewelry. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's the point, though. You don't do that if you really love the person. And you might do it if you really love them as a joke, you know, but you don't really do just that and you'd have to have their gift too. Any other comments or questions? I have a question. In the word to word translation, it says Priyatatmana means in pure consciousness. In the for the worse. From one in pure consciousness. So you have to offer it with pure consciousness? Yeah, that's the, that's the standard we're trying to get. And, and, and you, you know, you have to offer, try and offer with love and devotion. You should be thinking that way when you're making the offering. Right, in the translation. You should be thinking that way when you're cooking. Yeah, but in the translation, Srila Prabhupada just says love and devotion, but in the word-to-word -word translation, it says pure consciousness. So that was a little harder for me to 
<laughs> master. Well, get the consciousness as pure as you can and then offer it. I mean, Krishna knows what where we, we're trying. I mean, when, when I, I mean, I generally don't make offerings, but when I do, if, especially if I'm making an offering on the altar, I really try to offer it in pure consciousness. I'm not saying it is, but I try as best I can. I just want to offer it with love and devotion. If love, if you have love and devotion, that is pure consciousness, love and devotion for Krishna. So pure consciousness isn't just a, a nothing. It's it's something. It's thinking of Krishna. That makes sense. Anyway, Prabhupada is always in 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 his books, especially, he preaches the highest. So that's what we have to try to achieve. So to whatever state we're at, we have different types of consciousness. And sometimes it's purer than other times. And we have to try to, when we're making the offering to get to that purest state of consciousness that we can get to and then make the offering in that consciousness. And Krishna is pleased and Prabhupada's pleased. Because our consciousness, we, we have, everybody has between, you know, you have infinity, but my consciousness is between this point and this point, and sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, sometimes it's pure, sometimes it's dirtier. So, if we're making the offering, you've got to get to your point of pure, highest, purest consciousness you, you, you know. So we're going to offer our respectful obeisances now to. to oh, Jiva said that's why we offer to the spiritual master. We offer to him to offer it to Krishna. Oh. Okay. Okay, so is there any other questions? Because it's 8 o'clock, we're going to end. One last question if anyone has. More, more comment. Okay, thank you very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you.